Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required, and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. Superclouds. A friend of mine asked me if I had a view on them. I said, of course, a slightly cynical one maybe, or rather healthily sceptical if you like, in that supercloud seemed to me to be a gently arrogant term for multi-cloud, um, which actually itself as a term seems to have become synonymous for with multiple clouds, incorrectly. Like a lot of these IT silver bullets, things like clouds, containers, whatever, our industry likes to say that they, we've been introduced in order to reduce complexity. Until we realise, of course, that in order to sort of have these things, you need to add in a new layer to your architecture. One that you didn't know existed before, container organisation layer, super cloud or PaaS layer. And that obviously adds the number of layers back into our architecture. However, all in all, I think super cloud and multi cloud are great concepts and compelling from an IT point of view. Reduce skill set, total cost of ownership, legacy reduction. However, the pinch point remains. What's the additional business proposition? Welcome everyone, welcome to Toolkit Tuesday. Uh, we're on a weekly cadence at the moment and it's great to have you with us. Um, thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world. And my thanks to Paul Homan, as usual. Um, we missed you uh, last week, I think we didn't have one, Paul, but uh, great to have the EA minutes back. Um, always gives us something to think about and uh, 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 of course you're not cynical. Healthy scepticism is, uh, is how I'd describe it. Anyway, Great to have you with us, as I say. We have uh, a great topic today, which I'll come to in just a moment. But just before I, I get there, um, as I say, I'm delighted to have you with us. And I know some of you will be watching this in the, uh, in the comfort and uh, convenience of a time zone of your choice at, a, at another point in time. But uh, we love the, um, the live interaction uh, at these events. So um, please do chat to each other in the chat channel. Um, I kicked us off by uh, saying greetings from Sonoma County, California, an unusually wet um, Sonoma County, California. But we love to see where you're from. So please uh, let us know uh, where in the world you're joining us from. When it comes to questions, however, please don't use the chat channel. Please use the Q&A channel. And uh, if you can't see that, then click on the three little dots in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And that will give you the option to click on Q&A. Um, please put any questions for our speaker today into that. And uh, that will help me make sure I, I, um, I capture them. And please don't wait until the last minute to, uh, to put the question in there as soon as you think of it. So that's it for the for the housekeeping. Um, we're going to have a, uh, a, a talk today on um, that's going to introduce many of you um, and refresh some of you perhaps on the Open Group Face Consortium and some of the great work that's going on there. So I'm not going to steal our speaker's thunder um, and go through all that, except to say that the MOSA, the Modular Open Systems Architecture Approach that um, Alicia will describe today is um, is really being being demanded um, by the US government and increasingly elsewhere, I believe. So you even if federal avionics, uh, which is uh, where this all started, is not your thing, um, do do pay attention because one of the great values of architecture is um, to use it to solve complex problems in complex environments. And uh, avionics is one of those. So. Um, some of the lessons learned here can be uh, equally applicable um, to uh, many other industries. So 
As I say, without further ado, I, it's a great pleasure to welcome my colleague um, nowadays, Alicia Taylor, um, who is the Open Group Face Consortium Program Director. Um, <clears throat> prior to joining us um, at the Open Group, Alicia was active in the Face Consortium, actually. She spent six and a half years as a contractor to Axiant Inc., supporting the U.S. Army PEO Aviation. And as the PEO Aviation Project and Planning Analyst, Alicia was responsible for special projects, managing budgets, tracking tasks, providing expertise to the FACE and SOSA consortia, working with universities and coordinating the Army FACE and SOSA teams. Indeed, during her last nine months there, she supported the Digital Engineering and Model-Based Systems Engineering Program and contributed to Policy, Procedure and SharePoint Site Update. Um, so uh, Alicia has lived and breathed the FACE Consortium activities and uh, continues to do so. And uh, she's going to share um, what that's all about um, in the, to the extent that we allow in 20 minutes. Um, and uh, over to you, Alicia. A warm welcome from Toolkit Tuesday. Good morning, good afternoon, good day from Huntsville, Alabama in the United States. So welcome. What I want to do today is talk about the FACE Consortium, which is an open group consortium with over 90 government, industry, and academia organizations and over 1,400 individual members. Um, it's government, industry, and academia collaboration, encouraging innovation and in refining business processes, developing vendor-neutral open standards, which enable software portability, reusability, and inoperability. It started in 2010 as an approach designed as a response to U.S. government's uh, aviation community complex problems. Basically, the primary focus has been, in a, has been aviation. However, we do know that it's been applied to ground vehicles, weapon systems, training and simulation, commercial aircraft, and others. We are a mature software standard with a comprehensive ecosystem. As I mentioned, business processes, technical practices, we are a software standard, and um, we actually have two standards. We have the FACE technical standard, which is more well-known, and then the UDDL, which is Open Universal Data Description Language Standard. So the FACE initiative, I mentioned, started with a problem from the DOD, the US DOD, and typically what happens when aircraft are built, they are unique. They have a platform unique requirements by a single vendor where capabilities are tightly coupled with avionics, sensors, and operating system. And the FACE initiative changed that. And as you can see, this traditional or legacy model, um, it's unique. There's long integration cycles. It limits software reuse and increases uh, integration cost. So what happened is the FACE technical standard created an open layered architecture that allows any FACE software component to move from one aircraft platform to the next with minimal integration complexity on any desired hardware platform. The FACE technical standard is a standard of standards. It was based on over 60 proven commercial and military avionics standards, such as Airink 653, 661, OpenGL, POSIX, and more. Uh, done right, the resulting applications need minimal change to work in different platforms. And we've tested this out uh, through the years with something called uh, BITS event, which is an internal integration activity or a larger technical interchange. So basically, we have recreated um, a layered approach, a layered architecture, and that architecture um, is a reference architecture. And what the FACE technical standard does is it provides a software approach, as I mentioned, designed to address barriers of modularity, portability, and inoperability. It extracts or abstracts software capabilities into five logical segments. It has a reference and a data architecture. Um, it uses inter um, interface definition language or IDL definitions for the face interfaces. And then the programming language mappings from the IDL to the following languages. So face supports C, C++, ADA, Java, 
Uh, the technical standard is our keystone document. And it, as I mentioned, it describes both the reference architecture and the data architecture. When we started in 2010, the FACE approach, the FACE initiative was very unique because we required a data architecture. Um, and what that does is that promotes integration. The FACE technical standard, along with all of our documents, are open, non-proprietary. They're publicly available without uh, licensing term royalty, anything like that. And all this is going to be on our website, and I'll give you the link to that a little bit later. So the FACE reference architecture, it has five segments. You can see uh, these are color-coded. You'll see these colors appear anytime you see um, a presentation or something uh, at, a, at a conference or a workshop. Um, these are standard colors where you start out with a portable component segment, uh, platform services segment, iOS services segment, and operating segment. Um, as we move from the P PCS to the TSS, you can see interfaces on both sides. Um, those provide data specifics or they move data messages between the PCS and the PSSS, which is here. The IO services, again, data movement, external accesses to your uh, devices and your external hardware. And then you've got the OS segment, or, and you've got an a interface here. Now, the interfaces are very important because that's where you have um, these critical interfaces. These segments are defined by the critical interfaces. And so this whole structure, the face conformance architecture together give us the foundation of the face technical standard. So I mentioned earlier that the face consortium has a comprehensive and mature ecosystem. It defines key interfaces. It delivers a face technical standard and has developed and implemented a conformance verification certification program, which I'll talk about a little bit more. It enabled tool development. This is Toolkit Tuesday. Certainly, we need to talk about tools. Um, it's delivered the FACE data model, data architecture. We've developed business models that attract to government and industry. Uh, I mentioned that we've conducted annual integration events. We have a established repository of certified FACE conformant software applications. We've defined acquisition guidance in contracting language, and we just recently implemented a course accreditation program. So going back, um, the FACE technical standard, uh, how do you know something has been developed using the FACE technical standard? Well, we have a conformance program that ensures that the defined interfaces adhere to the FACE reference architecture. We have tool development. We have a number of tool development companies that are part of the FACE Consortium. These tools are used to generate code, data models. They support the FACE Conformant Program. Uh, they bridge a gap between languages, and they do more. Uh, some of the tools that are also available through the FACE Consortium uh, are the Conformance Test Suite. That's one of our primary tools, which is used to test code against the requirements of the FACE technical standard. We also have a Hello World called like Balsa. Currently, right now, um, Balsa is only available to FACE Consortium members, but we're working on getting that uh, publicly released. Um, as far as the, the tool development, the third-party tools within the consortium, um, some of those, unfortunately, are not free. Um, but we do have a website, or we do have a link on uh, the FACE Consortium website that um, provides additional information about some of those tools. So you can see our um, comprehensive ecosystem. I mentioned the FACE Registry. Uh, the FACE Registry is simply a listing of FACE certified conformant products. We refer to those as units of conformance. And the idea here is a unit. Um, as far as the FACE Consortium or FACE Technical Standards is concerned, we look at components and not systems. So we do not certify systems. Um, this gives the whole idea of modular being able to move one component to, to one aircraft back to the other or ground vehicle or fill in the blank. 
um, whatever your need is. It, we uh, The registry is, again, on our website. You'll see the, the fourth bullet down there has the link. Um, you can log in. There's a free login. You do need to register, but you can log in and access all of this information. The registry enables software developers, systems integrators, or anyone who wants to acquire software to find certified FACE UOCs. These are just some of our products in the registry. Uh, we currently have 39 conformant FACE products. Our registry has a three-step process. Uh, it goes through verification and certification. Oftentimes, a product will go through a verification. An organization or company will choose to take a product through verification, but they choose not to go through the certification process or list it on the registry. Uh, that really has to do with security reasons. A lot of companies um, uh, are DOD, and they may just choose not to um, list their products out in the public. But I do want to emphasize this, this registry contains metadata. It does not contain any source code or any intellectual properties. So you heard Steve at the very beginning talk about MOSA. Uh, MOSA is Modular Open Systems Approach. It actually started back in 2005, and uh, we've had a lot of movement, particularly in the last probably three to five years. And FACE, the FACE approach, addresses all five principles of MOSA and is one of either, it used to be the only, I think it's one of very few open standards that actually meet all of the five principles. You'll see we've established an enabling environment. We've got a technical standard data architecture. We've got tools, a rig reference and implementation guide. If you want to have a, a little bit more information about the technical standard, we have a three volume implementation guide. We've got examples for training. We've got contracting language. We've got a registry. Employees modular design. We have the face reference architecture and the data architecture. We've designated key interfaces. I talked about those. Use open standards. I mentioned that we are a standard of standard, having used over 60 existing and widely used standards to develop the face technical standard. And we have a, we can certify conformance. Anybody can say their product is made to a particular standard or developed using a particular standard, but we actually have a process that verifies that the product does meet the requirements outlined in the particular technical standard. So there's also a lot of misconceptions out there. First off, face adoption is only for DOD aircraft. As I mentioned earlier, that's where we started in 2010, helping Army, Navy, and Air Force aviation solve a complex problem. But we also know that it has been applied to ground vehicles, ships, weapon systems, training and simulation, and commercial aircraft. Good software is good software. Everything that we do requires software. As a matter of fact, as far as cost of software, you can see that increasing significantly. That's very important while we reuse things. The FACE technical standard uh, is subject to export regulations. That is not true. As a matter of fact, we just opened up membership to four additional countries, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and United Kingdom. Before we opened up membership, we did an extensive review. We talked to the State Department. And we know that there is nothing in our standard that is going to be subject to those export regulations. Uh, software cannot be face conformant and meet DOD 178C requirements. Again, that's false. We just released a guide that talks about face conformance and airworthiness. Uh, face consortium documents are proprietary. I mentioned earlier that everything that the FACE Consortium develops is on the website and it's free for you guys to use. I mentioned that we opened up membership to Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. If you're on the call and your organization is operating in one of those countries,
please talk to us. We'd certainly like to get you more information and get you involved. Uh, adopting the FACE technical standard is complex and cost prohibitive. We have shown over and over again that this is not accurate. As a matter of fact, I would say that not adopting the FACE technical standard is cost prohibitive. Um, it improves, improves integration, reduces integration cost. So if you happen to be from um, UK in one of the areas, I want to in personally invite you. Uh, the Open Group Summit is scheduled for the week of April 17th through the 20th. There is a program or a um, session on EA for sustainability and introduction to the FACE Consortium. It's on Tuesday, April the 18th from 11 to 1230. There's a link here. It's also on the Open Group site. And we would like to invite you, it's free of charge, to come learn more, to ask questions, and let's have a conversation. Maybe you're not from the U.S., maybe you don't use MOSA, but you're from the United Kingdom and your focus is on COSA or Pyramid. We want to talk more about that. So, in conclusion, the Open Group FACE Consortium collaborates on developing open software standards to innovate processes and practices and accelerate FACE adoption. For more information, you can go to the website at opengroup.org forward slash FACE. And my email address is a.taylor at opengroup.org. So I, um, are there questions? Thank you, Alicia. Um, very hard to cover a topic that's been uh being worked on since 2010 in uh, in 20 minutes or less um so great job thank you very much for doing that um we do we do have some questions for you um before i get to those i one of the things that that um i think is is particularly notable about the work that's gone on in the in the face consortium is is the fact that that the Clearly, there's a lot of important work being done on the technical standard, and that's really <clears throat> where the rubber hits the road. But what really happened to my mind that made a huge difference to the take up of the standard it is the focus from day one as well on the business side of things, the the rationale for using the standard, what the business problem was. Can you can you talk a little bit more about uh, about that and why that's important? Yes. Thank you, Steve. You know, anybody can create a standard, but really for the standard to be beneficial, it has to be widely accepted, adopted, and used. And it's those business practices, those business policies that help that happen. It's not just about the technical standard. It's about how to use that technical standard. It's about how it works with other standards. And all that kind of falls under the, the business working group or the business component. It's the business processes that promote the actual technical practices. Right, right, absolutely. And, you know, and it, it makes a real difference because, you know, standards get produced or things get put in procurement all, all the time. And, they, you know, if you're a program officer or a procurement officer, it, you, you see it and think, oh, another rock to fetch or something else I've got to worry about. We've got, we've got guidance and things that actually make it useful and helpful. And uh, it really does make a big difference. And we've, we've replicated that for, for those of you who've uh, uh, know a little bit about the open group or who, who, who've attended any of our events or previous toolkit Tuesdays, you'll, you'll have heard us talk about uh, some of the work in our Open Process Automation Forum, for example, and our SOSA Consortium and our OSDU Forum, um, all of which kind of learnt lessons from what's been going on in the FACE Consortium and the approach taken with this business first um, uh, approach, which is which is really, um, really important. So um, questions that that uh, that we've had, Alicia, um, what would you um, well, actually, you've answered one of them um, at least once, um, which is, do you have to join the FACE Consortium to have access to the technical standard and other documents? And I think um, just to save time, I think you said uh, other than uh, other than BALSA right now, which is a, a member only thing, uh, everything we publish is available worldwide yes. uh, for anyone to use. Yes. Yeah. OK, great. So. Um, 
what do you see as the FACE consortium priorities for the next few years? Well, one of the things we're trying to do is, is streamline processes. Um, we do know that going through the conformance process can uh, can be challenging sometimes, but we've had a focus. We interv- we surveyed our members, and we know what the members say, so we're focusing on streamlining processes, and we're also focusing on model-based systems engineering. Those are the two things that, that jump out at me quickly. Right. Okay. Thank you. And uh, probably last question in the interest of uh, of time. Um, you talked about um, uh, products being uh, developed in accordance with the face um, the face technical standard and the MOSA approach. Um, the question is: Has the face consortium seen an increase in the number of products being developed using the face requirements? Yes, we have. And as the three branches of service, well, actually four have those most of requirements that you're talking about. We're seeing a lot of products being um, developed. We're seeing products being put on um, aircraft, but we're also seeing the number of products in our library. Right now we have um, 39 products. Again, there's more out there to have been through the process, but are just not in the registry. But out of those 39 products, I would say that we've almost increased uh, 50% probably in the last probably four to five months. Um, everyone, particularly people in the U.S. and outside the U.S., as we work with our um, allies, are, are starting to focus on MOSA. And we know that the, the FACE approach, the FACE initiative, makes MOSA possible. And fortunately, our folks that created it a long time ago were, were forward-thinking enough to realize that. It's great. It's a, a great uh, great line to end on. Uh, Alicia Taylor, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us on Talk It Tuesday today. Thank, Thank you. you. Well done. So, um, as I say, thanks to Alicia and thanks to uh, Paul Homan for his video. Um, I think Paul actually joined us live today, if I'm not mistaken. So if you're if you're out there, Paul, then uh, thanks for joining. Um, and next week, as I said at the beginning, we're on a weekly cadence right now. So uh, next week we switch gears to an area that's being covered by the Open Group Open Footprint Forum. Um, and that's uh, basically uh, working on standards for um, capturing and reporting on energy emissions. So joining us next week, uh, we'll have, we'll have uh, Sani, S- Sami Lakshmanen, um, who is the co-chair of the Open Group Open Footprint Forum. Um, that's not his day job, obviously, but um, that's where he uh, he uh, interacts with us uh, most obviously and most most consistently. And he's going to be talking to us about empowering climate transitions through a carbon data model. And uh, this really is a, a forum and an activity that I expect we will all hear much more about because it's so topical. And uh, we at the Open Group are really in a position um, to uh, be working in a, in a niche area. Nobody is really working on um, a consistent way to to capture and report on these um, energy emission standards, starting with greenhouse gases and, and carbon emissions, but moving into other areas too. So please join us next week. It's um, a topic that uh, impacts every industry. And uh, Sammy will have some great stuff as usual to, um, to share with us. Um, and finally, uh, Alicia mentioned it, but a shameless plug for the Open Group Summit for those of you who are able to make it to London um, in person. The Open Group Summit will be at the QE2 Centre in Westminster from April the 17th to the 20th. We'd love to see you there. There's lots of uh, different topics being covered. Um, many of our forums and work groups are getting together and uh, public sessions and uh, uh, presentations on various various days so please look at our website opengroup.org for more information and meanwhile thank you for joining us today on toolkit tuesday thank you again to alicia um keep safe and well wherever you are in the world i'm steve nunn thank you for watching toolkit tuesday <laughs>